All right, guys. Well, we, if you have your handouts with you, we are going to go ahead and uh, jump in here in just a second. And so you don't get lost in the handouts. Uh, we're going to start with the nine marks of a healthy church, the little front and back single page. And just to keep you on your toes, we're not going to start on number one. Uh, we're going to actually start on the back of the page on numbers six and seven in just a moment. I like that at quarter to nine. Uh, <laughs> keep everybody from going keep, in order. That's exactly right. Uh, Jerry, can you uh, pray for us, and yes, then uh, we'll we'll jump in. Thank you all so much for, for coming this morning. Mm-hmm. I know a Saturday morning is uh, given a lot of your time, so thank you for doing that, and uh, mm-hmm. can you pray for us, Jerry? Yeah. Father, what a joy to come before your throne in grace. Uh, Lord, we are overwhelmed with your goodness, your love, um, the way you've protected us in uh, every way, but especially spiritually. Thank you that you who began that good work will carry it on to completion. You're doing that in these um folks and lord we pray that you would uh, give them great discernment of whether north avenue is the place to be lord we pray that we would um, be faithful in um, loving our people at north avenue well um, and that we would uh, disciple uh, and evangelize as you've called us to and we pray that even this morning you would use this time to encourage us uh, as you have every time we've opened your word and that we would um, have deeper conviction of our sin uh, and a deeper love for our Lord Jesus as uh, we finish this morning. And we uh, commit this time to you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, my wife and I were talking to Matt and Lydia last night, and uh, we were talking a little bit about why we started the church in the first place. And um, I think that, uh, and Jerry, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this a little bit. We wanted to have a church in the Athens area that, and, and this location happened to be perfect, and we, we hope that we can stay in this general area, uh, but we wanted to be kind of somewhere between the Madison County, kind of northeast of where we're at right here, and then sort of south uh, on the loop uh, of Oconee County and, and the broader Athens area. We wanted to be close to the loop so it was easy access for those two points, and uh, we had a number of families in the Madison County area and the Athens area that all had been talking about starting a church, and so. We wanted a church that was going to be, and every church falls short, but we we wanted a church that had uh, sound doctrine and teaching. We wanted a church that had a high view of church membership and a high view of the local church. Uh, We wanted a church that had reformed theology when it came to the sovereignty of God in salvation, uh, a biblical view, and we're going to talk about these things in more detail as we go, but biblical view of gender roles, those kinds of things. And um, we we wanted that available for, for that area. And by God's grace, Jerry and I, I'll just tell you real quick, Jerry and I showed up uh, one, what was it, was it, was it a July? When, when, what probably, time of the year was this? Yeah, probably, that seems like, it seemed like it was getting hot. 2015, yeah. I think it was. Now, th- this is how sophisticated our planning was, okay? Jerry and I, this is a true story. We're driving around, and we're like, you know, this, this church, Central Baptist, is the perfect location if we could, like, ask them if we could, like, rent space from them on a Sunday afternoon. So this, this was how incredible our planning was. Did we call ahead? No, we did not. When we showed up, were we dressed in our best? I was wearing a Jurassic Park t-shirt. I want this to be on the record. I still have the Jurassic Park t-shirt. I think Park that was t-shirt. on purpose. I think you were trying to impress him right out of the gate. <laughs> no. That big dinosaur <laughs> on the front. I look like I was 14 years old. Yeah. I think it's on the record. I, I look like a 14 year old. I get out with you. We, we go up to the door here, over here. We, we ring the little doorbell. And the secretary. Yeah, it's locked. Yeah, the, yeah. It's locked. the secretary sends the pastor to the door. And he's like, what, what do you guys want? Like, what are you asking for here? And we're like, um, we've got a. Kind of something we want to run by you. Uh, would what? you have a second? What did we say, Jerry? It was the most awkward conversation. I don't think the, the reason we didn't call ahead, I think we just heard about him like two hours before yeah, when we were right. with Mary. So <laughs> it's traipsed right on over and, uh, and talked to him. And immediately that was, boy, you talk about the Lord's goodness on things. He seemed way interested. I don't know why More or than how. Were, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I think he even said that. It's, it's like, man, that's saying, I don't know if you guys are really going to do it, but I think we, you, you know, and so it was, it was a, a, a instant um, joy to meet this. He's like, yeah, let's get together, together with the, the deacons and see if we can make this happen. And so we did. And we met was in that just, room behind those double doors right there yep. with their deacons. And we were like uh, praying about it, saying, Lord, help us out here because we don't ah, know what's going to happen. So the Lord did just keep opening doors. The one part, the important part that 86% of it that Mark didn't talk about that he wouldn't, so I have to talk about it or get to talk about is that we were really looking forward to 
hearing Mar Jerry, the, Jerry, we're not going to do this. No, we are going to start doing this. This is what Jerry talks about other people. In a yeah, way, yeah. It's way over the top. No, and you just no, can't this let is him, not can't over the top. That. This is uh, was so many times. Mark had been at Black Mountain and had spoken um, enough that a lot of people. I'm going to turn this off, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to turn this off. <laughs> we, we Scott, don't need, we Scott don't need to go down this whole story trail right now, Jerry. But it is a neat thing that. There were a lot of people that wanted to hear Mark teach the gospel. My mom was, was at the top of the list. She was a yeah. huge fan. Um, she was. Well, yeah, she was still waiting <laughs> to be sure. She didn't know if she was cheering for you or Scott. But, yeah, but That's it true. was a really a neat thing the way God orchestrated it. And there were a lot of those things that Mark talked about. And, um, and we were just very grateful. Organic is... I don't even know what that really means, but that seems like the way things happen without us planning very well or at all in a lot of cases. And so it's it's a little overwhelming to think about how how it's happened and then how God sustained it now for um, over eight years. Is that what we was it 16, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So a little bit more than eight years now. And so we're very, very grateful. A lot of room to grow, a lot of things to work on, but uh, but he's been so faithful to supply for us. I don't even just think financially. Scott, did you think anything would work financially? Probably not. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, other people didn't think. I mean, I just no. think one person told Jerry that uh, he said, "You will never get central." That's what he said. Like we would never, uh, they yeah. would never agree to let us rent it. I mean, so it just yeah. from the beginning, I think God has been in it clearly, and I think people question like, "How are y'all going to make it financially?" Like. Yeah. And God has provided above and beyond every time. Like, we've never had to worry about finances, even though yeah. I think some people were worried about that. Yeah. I mean, I just think these two guys have known each other for so long. I think it just reminded me when Jerry was trying to talk about Mark. Mark's trying to shut him down. This goes way back when you were teaching somewhere and you oh, told Jerry, like... It was the worst introduction of all time. <laughs> but then you, you went aside to him and said, Jerry, please, next time, just don't say anything. That's what you told him. Like, just keep yeah, it, yes, keep it yes. minimal. And then you said a little bit later, he, he wheeled over and he put, showed you like Proverbs, something like do not withhold honor where honor is yeah, due yeah, or something right, like that. Right. But then he got up there and he was like, Mark's going to teach. It's going to be great. Let's pray. Like, yes, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't help but say something. But I mean, yeah. yeah. You don't, this, is, this is a rule for life. You never want Jerry to introduce you to anyone because they're going to expect this amazing person to come walking in the door and then it's you. You, you walk in the door. You're like, wait, this is not, I thought we had this other person coming in that Jerry just described. Then that was you. So it's, yeah. But Jerry, you're very gracious. Yeah. Um, so let's turn to biblical church membership and um, if you have your Bible, go ahead and open to Hebrews 13. I'm going to try to put some of this on the screen. If this is, I don't know if I'm connected. Let me try this again. Um, so, biblical church membership. Uh, Scott, can you read uh, that number six there for us? Yeah, number six. Biblical understanding of church membership. Church membership is a privilege and a responsibility and needs to be regarded as such. People should only be members if they are dedicated to the church. In attendance, prayer, service, and giving, to allow people to become and remain members for sentimental or other unbiblical reasons makes light of membership and may even be dangerous. Yeah, so um, Scott knows I'm going to tell this illustration because I tell it every single time we do this. Um, I have said with a little bit of, I guess, biting sarcasm, but not really, I, I kind of mean it. Um, I think that in our culture today, we have a very low view of what church membership is. Um, I really do think, and I'm, I mean, again, it sounds silly, but I, I think it's actually true. We probably have a higher view of like rec league soccer membership than we do of church membership. So it's like, if you're, if you're playing rec league soccer, do, do you know exactly who the team members are? You've got like a roster, you know who's supposed to be there for practice. If the person doesn't show up, guess what? The coach is calling, the, the, the teammates are going, where were you? Are you playing in the game next time if you skip practice three times in a row? No, you're not going to probably. So like, we, we have a high standard, and I think that's a good thing. That's great for rec league soccer. But do you see how with the local church, it's like, I went through a phase in college, you did too, well, you less so than I did, where I went to the church I wanted to on the Sunday when I woke up. So it's like, okay, I like the preaching at this church, like my dad's church. I love hearing my dad preach. Okay, I love the music over here. I love the community over here. I love the this over there, the small group. Over, I, I, was, I could name you a list of churches I attended during my college years, and I was inconsistent at best. And I would sleep through it sometimes. I just sleep straight through it on a Sunday morning in college. So I saw it more as a consumer. And um, here, here's the other analogy. Think of it like a restaurant. When you're picking a restaurant, you're thinking about what suits your desires at the moment. So like I'm feeling like Italian, I'm feeling like Mexican, I'm feeling like this or that, pizza. Like you, you choose it based on your feelings in the moment. And when you're there, if somebody spills something, 
That's not my job to clean up, right? That's like the waiter's going to take care of it. The waitress will take care of it. Like, I'll, you know, so it's, it's like if there's, a, if there's a problem in the place, it's not my responsibility. Someone's going to deal with that. And so I think the consumer mindset has taken over for a lot of us in America where that's how we think of church. What do I want this Sunday? I go there. It feels good. I have no responsibilities. I've got no investment. I'm not leaning in. I'm just sort of letting people serve me and do stuff for me. And if I don't like it, I'm going to go to the other place. <clears throat> I think we both went through a bit of this phase. And I want you to talk about that in a second. But like seeing it more as we are in this together like a team, uh, working, to, think about all the one another's in the Bible. Love one another, forgive one another, serve one another, show hospitality to one another. That all assumes a mutual accountability, m- church membership in, in the New Testament. Scott, talk about your experience some there with, with learning to love the church. Yeah, I mean, we say privilege and responsibility, but I think the privilege side is the, the side that I'd want to emphasize, what I always emphasize here. Uh, yeah, certainly when I became a Christian, yeah, I loved to hear my dad preach. I loved to even sing with the people of God, but I, wouldn't, I didn't fold my life into the people of God. Like, I just wouldn't get involved. I would leave mm-hmm. pretty much right after, and I was missing out on, on so much. I just think, certainly with this church for eight plus years, when you, when you fold your life into the people of God and be around other believers who love you, uh, I mean, I just thought about this when, when growing up, like huge Braves fan. And I remember when the Braves were like in the World Series, I was thinking, man, I would love to play second base for the Atlanta Braves. That, that was like my, my <laughs> dream would have been. Now, of course, I couldn't hit worth a flip. So there's no way they would have me. But I thought what a privilege it would be to play for the Braves. But I really believe it. It is a far greater br- privilege to be a part of a local body of believers where you're mm-hmm. with brothers and sisters in Christ who love you, who you share this deepest common bond together. And I mean, I've told different stories on this. One, when our church started, we did a discussion group, and we would meet literally every week, same 10 to 12 people in our group, like the Chronics, like the Fierros, the Rodriguez's, and you just around the same people over and over again. I remember after three or four months, I remember sitting there before it started, looking around the room, and I thought, I genuinely love these people, like deeply. I know that they love me deeply, and it's just, what a privilege to be a part of it. Just recently at my book club, we had a prayer time at the end, Carter prayed for another person in our group, and he prayed with such love Mm -hmm. for this person. And I mean, you could, you could feel it. It was like palpable in the air, this deep love. He prayed sincerely, like just concisely. It was a beautiful prayer. And I'm like, this is what's, what is a part, a part of being a local church. This is the privilege. Like you get to be people who really care about you deeply. They're, they're taking your needs before the throne of grace out of love. So what a privilege. Like it is a mm-hmm. huge privilege. And we are really robbing ourselves when we don't fold ourselves into the people of God. Yeah, and we would went. Like I, I have two brothers. I love being with those guys. They're, it's so much fun and enjoy to be with them in our and to be adopted into God's family and have all of these brothers and sisters Scott I think it's just like you're describing it's a, it's a joy to be with our family not just on a Sunday afternoon but you know throughout checking with each other and doing that we want to grow in that area for sure and I love the fact that we're not at all to do the ministry so much that's for all that we're just to equip people to do the ministry and uh, the rest of the church then, because certainly as just the four of us elders, we would not be able to get to everybody very well. But if everybody is reaching out to each other and loving the brothers and sisters like Scott's describing there, it's a really beautiful thing, I think. Yeah, that, that, that has been kind of an anchor verse for us since we started, is the verse you preached on it just a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. uh, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. So it's, I'll probably butcher the wording, but Christ, when he ascended on high, gave gifts to men. He gave the apostles and prophets, which we believe is the foundational biblical gift of God's word. And then he gave evangelists, those are still around, uh, pastors, shepherds, and teachers to not do the work of ministry, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry, yeah. for building up the body of Christ, that we might all reach maturity and mature manhood in Christ. So it is very much like, the, to go back to the soccer illustration, um, it's not like the coaches think coaches as pastors here in this analogy. It's not like the coaches are playing on the field, right? They're equipping the players to play the game. And so, of course, pastors are part of the game too. But the whole point is we're all on the field. We're all participating in this. And that, that's, that's the beauty of the church is that it, mm-hmm. it's not the paid professionals. It's everybody who is involved and, and is, is vital to the, to the life of the church. So let's look at Hebrews 13, 17. I'm also trying to put it on the screen here. Uh, Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, this verse is interesting to me because the more you stare at it, the more you see in this verse. Uh, When you look at this verse, it's first of all, this is a terrifying verse for anybody who's a pastor because you've got an accountability before the Lord for how you pastor your church. And if I can just be really honest with you, there are a lot of nights before I go to bed, I, I spend my time with the Lord at night rather than the morning. That's just how I work. I'm a night person. So in the evening when I'm with the Lord, 
it, it is very common that I feel my failures in all areas of my life, uh, and I, I see God's grace for me, but I, I see my failures as a, as a husband, as a father, and I see my failures as a pastor on a regular basis staring me in the face. So the, verses like this are extraordinarily weighty because we, we give an account to the Lord. And, uh, but look at what it says. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls, as those who have to give an account. This is so clear that we are not simply, you know, if I'm a Christian, I'm just part of the church universal, right? I'm part of the church universal. I don't need to be part of a local church. This text would make no sense if we're just sort of part of the nebulous church out there somewhere. Obey your leaders would mean what? Obey the leaders of a particular church, and they're accountable for particular sheep. I'm not accountable for the, for the sheep at uh, Resurrection Presbyterian, or at, at Redeemer, or at Faith, or at Watkinsville First Baptist, or at Green Acres, or at Cleveland Road. I'm not accountable for those individuals. We're not accountable for those. We're accountable for the members of North Avenue Church. And those other pastors are accountable for their sheep. But th this text is clearly <clears throat> implying that you can't make sense out of New Testament Christianity if you're not a member of a local church accountable to particular leadership who are accountable for you. Like, it doesn't make sense. So these verses, people say there's no verse that says you have to join a church. Every verse of the New Testament assumes that if you're a Christian, you're an active part of a local church and you're under the leadership and accountable, accountable to, to the leaders of a local church. So any thoughts about that, Jerry? Uh, no, that's, that's good. I mean, I just think it's, it's a weighty thing. I mean, like, the, the responsibility of being a member to fold your life in, but it's a weighty thing for us. I mean, it really is. I, I, even after we had an elders meeting this week, and I just remember after that meeting, I was just thinking, man, I, I feel like I want to love our people better. Like you feel, I'm going to have to stand before God one day, and the particular members of our church, I have to give account for. I mean, it's just a huge weighty thing, and you're constantly wanting to do it better, rely on the Lord's help. I mean, I think we talked about my dad before when he was in a church in Atlanta, and uh, the membership role was ginormous. I mean, it was just huge. People who had never, they'd never seen these people in years, and they're still in the membership. And so my dad just started systematically started wiping people off the, the membership role, and they, his church got written up, the, like <coughs> the biggest loss of membership like in a year. But my dad was taking this very seriously. He's going to have to stand before God and give account for his memory, and people don't even know who this person is. It's like, we have to just take that. Yeah. It's just a very serious thing. Yeah, when the, when the average attendance of a church is one-fifth the membership role, something has gone horribly wrong. Because it, you know, old, this lady here, is, we haven't seen her in 30 years. She moved away, but she's a member of the church. Well, that is not, how can you be accountable to that person? How can they know what's going on in your church if you don't even know where she's at or who she is? And so my dad, yeah, my dad removed hundreds of people and excommunicated like hundreds of people uh, because they, could, they were gone. Some of them were dead. Some of them were just removed from membership. But it's like, uh, that's my dad realizing that this is a big deal. Who, who's on the list matters. And we, we need to be accountable for those people. All right, let's look at number seven on our sheet, biblical church discipline. If membership is a foreign concept, can we all agree church discipline is about as foreign a concept in the American church as we can find? So Scott, read number seven for us. <clears throat> biblical church discipline. Discipline guides church membership. The church has the responsibility to judge the life and teaching of the membership since they can negatively impact the church's witness of the gospel. Leadership needs to be firm and discipline as this is an expression of love to the congregation. Yeah, so turn with us to Matthew 18, and I'll try to put it on the screen as well. Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> this is the classic text, and we'll be getting to this in soon in Matthew as we work through the gospel of Matthew. So a few months, we'll preach on it again. But Matthew 18, and we'll start in verse 12. And uh, Scott, can you just start reading there at verse 12? Sure. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So you already see here that the, the, if you have 100 sheep, our church has got 120-something sheep, right? So if you've got 100 sheep and one wanders away, uh, Jesus doesn't say, well, hey, just be glad that you still got 99 coming and everything's fine. No, that one that's wandered off, Jesus says, you've got to leave everything and go after that one. And uh, when you, what's the goal, by the way, of pursuing this person? What's the goal? To win them back. You want to win them mm -hmm. back. And you, you rejoice when this person is restored. So let's keep going. Verse 15. If your brother sins against <clears throat> you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Pause right there. Um, Scott, can you explain a little bit what is going on in this text? Because this is very foreign to some people, I think. What's happening here? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I mean, I think 
if someone sins against you, we want to go individually to them and out of love for them and just confront them in their sin and just say that we see genuine sin in you. And if, if they repent, then you've won them back. But if they refuse to, re- to repent, then you want to grab, you know, one or two others and you go with them and tell them and plead with them to, to repent. And if they still don't respond to that, then you have to go before the whole congregation. I mean, again, this is a long process of mm-hmm. time, but again, this is a loving thing. You're trying to w- win them back. Yeah, that last line in seven, it's an expression of love to our congregation. And I think the most hateful thing we could be to do to somebody is just to let them go, right? And I think that's most of the time what somebody that's straying a little bit, they, they would almost feel better about that because like, they don't really want to be confronted. Like None of us really enjoy that to be confronted on our sin, but it's what we have to do. It's what we want to do because we love people because we don't want them sins destructive. And so we don't want them living in in that, or to rob glory from the Lord Jesus that he deserves when, when they're part of a church and, and people know that. That's, uh, so everybody loses when you have somebody out there uh, living a life that's not worthy of the gospel. So it is our responsibility. Hardest thing to do. Oh, it's the most painful. But, uh, but it's just necessary, and, and we have to do that. And we want to be a church that does that faithfully, you know, hopefully rarely, but faithfully. So what, what we've often said for church discipline is it's loving in three different ways. And you've just touched on this. Number one, is it loving to the individual person who's going astray to confront them if it's like a serious sin that if they don't repent, it leads to destruction? Like say a boyfriend and girlfriend are sleeping together, right? And they're members of this church and we find out about it. Well, should someone immediately go one-on-one and call, let's say a guy goes and calls the guy out and says, you've got to, you've got to immediately stop this. That's right. If the person does not, says, I don't, like, I don't really care. Like, we're going we're gonna to keep doing this. I don't care. If that's their response, then don't you have to take one or two others with you to, to make it show it's more serious? There's, I'm not just a, a one person thinking this. Other people in the church believe the same thing I do, and we're all co- confronting. Now, two or three people confront the couple, and the boyfriend says, yeah, I still don't really care. Like, I'm a Christian. I know the Lord. I, I don't, I don't, we're going to get married one day. It's fine. Okay, now, what do you have to do? I mean, this, again, this could be months, but eventually what's going to have to happen is you've got to tell it to the whole church in a members meeting. You have a members meeting, and <clears throat> uh, you, you tell it to the church what's going on. You don't have to give over-the-top details, but you give the basic enough for everyone to know what's happening. And you say, okay, we got three witnesses who are, who are testifying to this. We've called to account. They have not repented. And so now, the church is going to find a way to pursue this person. The, the whole body in some way is going to go after this person and say, we're all together. We love you enough to say, we all agree. You, you've got to come back and repent. And if they don't repent at that point, then you have another members meeting and there's probably going to be tears involved, but you got to say, look, they've been, they've, we've been through all three steps Jesus gave. One-on-one, two or three, whole church. They've refused to listen to any of those groups. And so now the most loving thing we can do is to say, it's so serious that you no longer have a credible profession of faith. Might you still be a believer? Maybe, but we can't see it. And so our job is to act on what we can see. If you're unrepentant on a serious, blatant, obvious sin like that, or drunkenness, or you could name a bunch of things, we're going to, as Paul will say, hand you over to Satan. That's his, that's his language. Kick you out of the community of the church, put him into the realm of Satan, put him into the realm of the world, and then... The goal is still that the person becomes so miserable out there that they go, I don't know what I was thinking. I mm-hmm. repent. We're, we're, we're never going to do that again by God's grace. We're coming back in. And then you welcome them with open mm-hmm. arms you know, when that happens. If that happens, that's what you, that's what you pray to ha- have happen. Um, let, let's, Jerry, what's well, you, you I was just going to ask, can you explain kind of which sins this would apply to because our sins yeah. of selfishness and pride and those sort of things are apparent all the time? Yeah. But when, when do we do this and when do we not? So th- these would be uh, obvious public sins. So you can't do sins of the mind. I don't know what someone's thinking. You can't do, well, this person might be a little bit like, I assume this or that. No, no, we're talking about like very blatant, obvious stuff. So mm-hmm. like uh, habitual drunkenness would be an easy one. Uh, sexual immorality acted out in a very deliberate way. Adultery, uh, unlawful divorce. And how about this one? It can be doctrinal. If a person mm. rejects the Trinity, they will go to church discipline. If a person accepts the Catholic doctrine of like transubstantiation or something. These, these, are, these would be like a weird, like what's going on here? If someone says Mormonism is, is legitimate, uh, the true Christian faith, I mean, something like that, you would have to go under church discipline. But here's one that might be more relevant to where we're at today is if a person says, you know what? I think same-sex relationships can honor God. Mm-hmm. 
And, and I, in my own conscience, I no longer want to say that homosexuality is sinful in any way. I support that. And I think that Christ, if he was here, would support same-sex marriage and same-sex relationship. Well, that is actually worthy of excommunication because it's such a serious uh, error. Because to get that wrong is to, to lead people to, mm -hmm. to destruction. So let me finish the list here. Is it loving to the individual, even if it's tough love, to pursue them? Yes. Number two, and th th we, we can miss this. Is it loving to the actual local church where this is happening? Yes, because Paul says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you don't, like boyfriend, girlfriend sleeping together as members, everyone knows about it and no one confronts them. What does that tell every other dating couple? Whatever they say from the pulpit, they don't mean it because they're not doing anything about it. So it must be fine. So then is that, is that going to tend to spread sexual morality in your church if you don't do anything? Yeah. What about this? If, if, a, if a couple has, is unlawfully divorced and there's adultery, is that going to tend to make other people with their marriage vows a little looser, a little bit like, well must not be that big of a deal. So it's actually loving to the entire church to say this is the standard of holiness that Christ would hold us to. Number three, even though the world won't think this, is it loving to the watching world? Mm. Does it protect the public reputation of Jesus? Yeah. Even if the world doesn't agree with the biblical morality, what's the number one accusation we get? The church is full of it's hypocrites. Weird. Is this a way to deal with true hip hypocrites in the church? Like true full-blown hypocrites are meant to be removed ultimately, and does that protect the reputation of Christ publicly? So it's loving to the individual, it's loving to the church, it's loving to the watching world, and it's honoring to God. So even though it's not popular, it's definitely biblical, and it's definitely the right thing to do. Scott, can you read verse 20? Because I always get a little smile out of how verse 20 is used here. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. The two or three refers back to the two or three doing church discipline. It's not referring to the prayer meeting that you showed up at and there was no one there except one other person and the person said, you know what? And there's only two or three Jesus is here in a special way. I mean, that may be true, but that's not what that verse is about. This verse is saying when two or three witnesses come bearing witness against a brother who is in sin and they are saying what's true, does Jesus in heaven agree on earth with what the two or three are doing? Yeah, th this verse actually means when a church excommunicates an, a sinning member with, doing it according to Christ's word, Jesus is with them. I think it's one of the most misused verses in, in, from Jesus because it's about excommunication. It's not about the prayer meeting. But I mean, it's probably true in some secondary sense with the prayer meeting. Turn one, we, we don't have to keep going on this for a long time, but turn to 1 Corinthians 5 to your right. And uh, just because this text is even maybe stronger on this issue, or at least as strong, we'll just read through part of this quickly. And uh, start in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Scott, can you read for us again? 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Just, just notice there, you've got removal, and from among you would mean, doesn't that have to mean there's a group of people mm -hmm. known as the church among you, and you're moving them from that number? Doesn't that include church membership and then removal from membership? Keep going there, Scott. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Yeah, and so there, again, you see the purpose of church discipline. Even handing the man to Satan is meant to do what to his spirit? That his spirit might be saved mm -hmm. in the day of the Lord. So even though it's severe, it is meant, for, it is meant as an act of mercy. See, look at the, uh, I don't think I'd caught this before in verse two, and you are arrogant. It would be arrogant not to um, take action there. Yeah. Is that what it's Yeah, I mean, it, it? maybe they had an abused view of grace, like what grace allows, yeah. but them not taking church discipline is, is, in, is connected arrogant. to their arrogance, it seems like. Hmm. Verse six, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. Now, look, verse 11 is so crucial on this issue. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So what does that verse mean? Because it, it, first of all, it only applies to people professing faith, mm -hmm. those, those who bear the name brother. But what, what is this verse telling us when it says not even to eat with such a one? 
and I'll just say, I'll say a word about this. I think that it's saying, don't just treat your relationship with that person casually. Mm -hmm. Like, just don't go hang out with the person and act like nothing's going on. If this person is in deliberate, clear, unrepentant sin, you don't just hang out and shoot the breeze. If you're going to meet with them, that's fine, but you need to talk about the sin issue. <laughs> you're not just going to hang out and just kind of be friends and just act like nothing's going on. Uh, no, it's, it's got to be deliberate for, for why you're going to talk to that person. And again, that wouldn't be loving. It wouldn't be loving just to let them go down the... You know, with any of our kids, we don't let them go play in the street. The loving thing to do is to get them out of there. And that's what they're doing spiritually. That's good. Scott, continue here for the yeah. chapter. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. All right. Um, let's take a moment here. We're going to switch gears and we'll come back to the sheet in a moment. Let's go to the, the sheet called the Biblical Obligations of Elders and Members at North Avenue Church. And this will take a minute, but I, we want to read through the whole thing because for those who join the church, if you look at the back of this handout, you actually have a sign. You, you, you put your signature on it. I, Mark McAndrew, hereby, by the grace of God, vow to place myself under this covenant. So all members and elders at our church uh, are to sign this uh, when you join. And just you just need to know kind of what the commitment is that we're making. The first page is about the elders only, and then the next pages are for all of us, including the members. So Scott, can you just work through this, and let's just read through it line by line. We won't make a lot of commentary, but we'll just kind of sort of read it so everyone can hear it. Okay. Uh, biblical obligations of the elders to the North Avenue Church body. As shepherds and overseers of a local church, elders are entrusted with teaching, protecting, leading, equipping, and caring for the corporate church body and her individual members. The following is an overview of the requirements for elders as spelled out within the scriptures. The elders covenant to help train up future elders and deacons according to the criteria assigned to them in the scriptures. The elders covenant to prayerfully seek wisdom from the Lord in guiding our church community and stewarding her resources to the best of our ability based on our study of the scriptures and our following of the Holy Spirit who inspired all scripture. And the elders covenant to care for the church and seek her growth in love, truth, holiness, and unity in the gospel. The elders covenant to provide teaching and counsel from the whole of Scripture, whether that unchanging teaching is considered in season or out of season by our ever-changing culture. The elders covenant to equip the members of the church for the work of ministry. The elders covenant to be on guard against false teachers and teachings. And the elders covenant to lovingly lead the process of biblical church discipline when necessary for the glory of God, the good of the one disciplined, and the health of the church as a whole. And the elders covenant to set an example and join members in fulfilling the obligations of church membership stated below. Biblical obligations of the members of the, to the North Avenue Church body. As those who have experienced the grace of a life changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to reflect the character of Christ through the pursuit of godly attitudes and actions and the rejection of those that are contrary to Scripture. The Bible refers to this reality as living by the Spirit. The requirements of this membership covenant are in no way intended as an addition to the biblical obligations of a believer. Rather, this document functions primarily as an accessible yet non-exhaustive explanation of what the scriptures teach about the obedience that saving faith produces. <clears throat> so I covenant to submit to the authority of the scriptures as the final and decisive word on all issues of life and doctrine of behavior and belief. I covenant to pursue the Lord Jesus Christ through a regular practice of the spiritual disciplines, including Bible reading, prayer, and loving fellowship with the other members of our local church. I covenant to follow the command and example of Jesus by participating in the ordinance, ordinances prescribed to his church, by being baptized after my conversion as a public display of the truth of my union with Christ in his death and resurrection, by regularly remembering and celebrating the person and work of Christ through communion. I covenant to regularly participate in the life of North Avenue Church by attending weekly services, engaging in gospel-centered community, and serving the other members of this church. As Hebrews 10 says, we commit to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting, neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. I covenant to wisely steward the resources God has given me, including time, talent, spiritual gifts, and finances. This includes giving that is sacrificial, cheerful, and voluntary. I covenant to strive by the Holy Spirit's grace and power to walk in holiness in all areas of life as an act of worship to Jesus Christ, I make it my aim to put my ungodly attitudes and actions to death by the Spirit's strength. Below are a few examples of actions addressed in the Scriptures. I will practice complete chastity unless married, and if married, complete fidelity within heterosexual and monogamous marriage. This means, among other things, that regardless of my marital status, I will pursue purity and fight against lust and all sexual temptation toward immoral practices such as adultery, premarital sex, homosexual behavior, pornography, and sexually perverted speech. 
If married, I will seek to preserve the gift of marriage and agree to walk through steps of marriage reconciliation at North Avenue Church, including meeting with the elders before pursuing divorce from my spouse. I will refrain from illegal drug use and drunkenness. I will fight my temptation to gossip, slander, and cause disunity in the church. I will forgive from my heart offenses committed against me by others because I have been forgiven of so much more by Jesus. No, I think it's worth back. I covenant to use my freedom in Christ to best serve and love others while resisting the temptation to abuse my liberty by presenting stumbling blocks to another. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I covenant to submit to the discipline of God through His Holy Spirit by following the biblical procedures for church discipline where sin is evident in another, the hope of such discipline being repentance and restoration, receiving righteous and loving discipline when approached biblically by fellow believers. I covenant to do the following when I sin, confess my sin to God and to fellow believers, repent and seek help to put my sin to death. I covenant to submit to the elders and other appointed leaders of the church and diligently strive for unity and peace within the church. And I covenant to do the following should I leave the church for righteous reasons, to notify the elders, to seek another church with which I can carry out my biblical responsibilities as a believer. Jerry, any comments on, on all of this? I know that it's a lot to read all at once, but any comments about anything? Yeah, it is. I, mean, I, was, I think it's just always encouraging to, um, to read through this, but I need to do it more often. Um, you know, convicting as to what we're called to do as elders and then what all of us are called to do um, to live this life in a manner worthy of the gospel and to help each other to, to do so and to remind each other when we're maybe not uh, doing it as well as we ought to. Yes, and just on the very last thing you read about, about going to another church, uh, th- this, is, <clears throat> this is something that obviously just happens, whether you move away or you're going to another church in the area. Um, it, it can be very, it, it might, sometimes people feel awkward to bring it up to the elders and say, hey, like I'm thinking about going to this other church or whatever it might be. It's not awkward at all to us. Uh, mm-hmm. th- this is just part of life. And so if, if someone's switching to another church, even if it's in the area, that's great. As long as they preach the gospel, we are not going to be bothered by that. We just want to know ahead of time. So sometimes mm-hmm. someone will sort of disappear and it's hard to contact them. And then you find out, okay, they're going to a great church down the road. That's awesome. But just we need to kind of settle like what's going on. Like, Are you, are you joining that church? That's great. We just need to be able to hand the baton off to the other church and officially uh, communicate with them to say, okay, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're leaving now. They're joining your church now. And just know that we are not going to be weird about that. We're, we're, we're more than open because otherwise it's harder to kind of hunt, hunt someone down, try to figure out where they are, what's going on. So that's just part of the, sometimes people don't know how, how, how am I supposed to leave a church well? Just yeah. let the elders know. Well, and we know that it's not God's desire for everybody in Athens that's a believer to go to North Avenue. Oh yeah. We only have room for like 300 people. <laughs> That'd be, so that's, you know, so God's, we realize that and are thrilled by that. We do have our, whatever, there are 120 something members that we want to serve and, and care for faithfully. But uh, we're, and I would say this it, while we're talking church membership, we are not after church growth just for growth's sake. Would you comment on that a little bit? Like it's been very incremental and I think that's been good. Um, yeah rather than something really fast. Mark Dever preached a sermon at a conference a few years ago that has just, it's one of my favorite sermons I've ever heard him give. And I think it's called Endurance, Strength for a Slow Reformation. And he basically argues for slow church growth. I mean, not that you you can't control the church growth, but he he argues for why you you don't want to have a a large wave of people coming in who have completely different views of the Bible and God and everything, and you bring them into the church, and then there's just going to be division and confusion and differences, and there's going to be all kinds of issues He said, generally speaking, you can't, I mean, God can do whatever God, I mean, Pentecost, there were 3,000 converts on one day. So you can't, if that happens, that happens, and you work through it. But he just said, don't be afraid of slow growth, uh, because very often God is growing people to maturity, and through that process, the church can maintain health as that that happens over time. So, yeah, yeah. no, go ahead. Scott, don't you think there's been a a, a neat unity at North Avenue? Well, I love being with the elders. That's one of my favorites. But I think it's also been a unity in the church where there hasn't been uh, a lot of, I don't know what you would say, straying or pushback on things. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, it's been huge unity. And yeah, I mean, I remember when our church was starting to grow at one point, Jerry was just like, how are we going to disciple all these people? I mean, if you feel the weight of responsibility, if it's growing fast, I mean, we, you want to be faithful no matter what the Lord brings. Yeah. But I do think our church, like people have grown theologically. Deep that's where, what we do want to That's grow. what we do want to see. And then what mm-hmm. happens is you have this, a bunch of people who are really strong theologically, they're, they're mature in the faith, and you have 
maybe other people come into the church and then they start, they start folding their life into these the other people and they, they, they start learning from these other people. I, mean, I think like a Grant Crane or somebody has just grown a ton and then mm-hmm. see him start talking to like a Shane uh, Allen early on and just say, man, this is wonderful. And, and, and discipleship just spreads and spreads and people are growing deeper and deeper and the unity in the bonds there. It's just, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're there. I think that's the, the real key. We don't might not have room for more than 300 people in, in our building. But we have room for as deep as anybody can go. That's, there's no limit on the depth. That's what we want more of. And that's why I think we've seen, been very, very thankful for that. That's good. So let's switch here sheets back to the nine marks, uh, the nine marks here. And uh, we're going to, now we're going to go through in order, uh, starting in number one. And uh, I'm, I think this may come up in my sermon on Sunday, so I, this comes up occasionally. But uh, the first one is expositional preaching. Uh, let me read that for us. Expositional preaching, otherwise known as expository preaching, is the investigation of a particular passage of Scripture whereby the pastor carefully explains the meaning of a passage and then applies it to the members of the congregation. The point of a sermon then takes the point of a particular passage. This is in opposition to the topical preaching showcased in, the many evangelical, in many evangelical churches where Bible passages are woven together to support a pre-existing point. And I would love to hear from y'all on this, but just a quick word is, uh, my favorite definition of expositional preaching is like three words, uh, letting text talk. Hmm. And I, that, that's what you want. You want, you want to be lo- sitting out in the pew looking at your Bible going, I can see where this is coming from. Like what's coming from the pulpit is coming from the text. And y- I, I, the accountability is amazing because if you have a hundred people in front of you, as if I'm preaching or if they're preaching, if you have a hundred people in front of you and you're walking verse by verse through a text, it's very hard to cheat people. Because what am I going to do? What can you do with the text? You've you got to say what it says. And if you don't say what it says, if you leave out an embarrassing verse, everyone knows in the room. Everyone's like, wait, why didn't you mention like the obvious verse that's like everyone's wondering about? Well, it, it's, it's kind of mutual accountability. So letting text talk is the goal. You want the text to be in control of the sermon. We all fall short, but that's, what, that's the goal. And Scott, why do we do systematic exposition through books of the Bible 98% of the time? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it guards us from doing hobby horse uh, teaching, which we've joked about this before. Like Mark, when Mark first became a Christian, he had this, he had a gigantic <laughs> hobby horse. It was like Piper's stuff, like yes. God's glory and like our, our joy, joy are together. And he talked about it over That's and over. All and over. Talked about. For well, like three two years, or three hobby horses <laughs> after a year or two. He grew. There were more horses. I had like three Expanded messages out. I gave all the time but for they years. They were good. <laughs> I can, in fact, I heard them over and over, and I loved them. <laughs> Can you go back to one of those maybe like just in a little... Oh, that's horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it guards you. I mean, like Jerry would preach on Romans 8 if he could. Probably every time. <laughs> I think he said every Bible class would be Romans 6th grade, 7th grade, and on. I mean, I would do Redeeming the Time if I could. Like, I love the subject. So, but if you do expositional preaching, it guards you from that. And you're going to do passages that you honestly are kind of uncomfortable doing. Like, you gave me the genealogy of Jesus. And I remember getting that. I'm like... I would never have chosen the genealogy. I remember reading through that thing and just like, Matthew how? 1. Matthew yeah. 1. And I was like, how am I going to preach this thing? Like, this is insane. But then it, it, you grow in it. And you're robbing the people of God if you do not go through the whole counsel of God. But going through the whole counsel of God, you, you get the whole biblical, the Bible washes over you. I mean, we grew up with my dad systematically. I mean, he just, book in the New Testament. He'd go verse by verse. He'd switch to the Old Testament, verse by verse. He'd go back to the New, back to the, like he's going back and forth. 44 times he yeah, did that, like, back and forth. And he, you're, the people of God are getting the whole counsel of God, all these verses, all these passages that are neglected. You're forced to, to confront them. It is just so good uh, for the life of, uh, of the church. I, I just remember my dad went to a church around, I won't say the name, and he was just visiting. He said the pastor read the passage and then basically went off on his own. And my dad said he felt so strongly he wanted to go up. He said if he was going to go there again, he was going to say, next time would you please like touch the text? Like you're not touching the text. You've got to get in the text and go through the verses. I love that. Your people are watching. You can't uh, manipulate it or whatever. Everyone's got their Bibles out, and it's just a wonderful thing for the people of God. Might be overly simplifying things, but we just want to teach what God's given us, right? Not what we're deciding, but God's given us His Word. Every word of it is inspired. We want to teach everything that God has for us. Otherwise, we're certainly missing out on what He's, what He intends. Yeah, and w- one more thing. We could go on about this for a while, but what what I love is it keeps you in the center of biblical tension mm-hmm. because uh, like, so you may never pick, like maybe no one would ever want to say, I want to just preach a sermon on hell. But if you're preaching through Mark's gospel or Matthew's gospel, it's going to come up in the text so frequently that you can't avoid it. So it, however often a subject comes up in the Bible, 
hopefully that will be about how much it comes up in the preaching. So it, yeah. it really keeps you tethered to scripture. And people won't be wondering, did he pick this text because he's trying to get this agenda across? Is that why the pastor you know, picked this text? No, he's just picking the next, pa- if it's just the next paragraph, in, in a sense, you could say God is picking the text. It's just, it's whatever the scripture says next is what, is what we're going to talk about that Sunday. So I, I think there's something, it keeps everyone kind of in check in that, mm-hmm. in that regard. Yeah, I just say one other thing, I mean, we keep saying, we just, we, Jerry and I have doing, we did Esther and Ruth and like studying those books. Like I haven't, we, all of us said it. Pablo Fred said the same thing. We've never actually studied them, but you take the time to study a book of the Bible that you haven't studied before, and it's like all this stuff just rises up out mm-hmm. of there. I mean, there's, there's diamonds in there that you wouldn't see, and you'd rob yourself. I mean, that's Boaz, I'm still struck by his godliness. I just still <laughs> cannot get over his midnight roost there. He's just thinking in a God centered way. It's just extraordinary. But had we not gone there, like I've been robbed from that, and mm-hmm. our people are robbed. So it's just, ah, oh, it's such a wonderful thing. Yeah. And that's because we've talked about this with Mark so many times. I think Mark's favorite text has become whatever he's preaching. And I think that's what happens. Then all of a sudden, rather than just camping out in Romans 8, where I want to be, all of a sudden, Esther and Ruth have just exploded with this gold nuggets everywhere in there. And I might have been missing them, you know? And so it, it's, it is extraordinary like that. God's Word is so alive and active, and we get that when we preach it all. Yeah, I'm just... We keep saying, we're going to say one more thing about this. Uh, so bad. Uh, I mean, just, just a personal testimony. Uh, Ezra, which we preached, uh, what was it, last summer, um, was a book of the Bible that I probably spent less time reading than almost any book in the Bible. And part of the reason I picked it was because it was a book that I'd, I had given so little thought or time to. And I was like, I, I, it's almost like an experiment. Like, I know God's Word is always going to prove to be amazing, but this was a book that really scared me. And so I partly picked it because I just didn't know much about it. And then to, to dive into the commentaries and study it much more than I ever had before, I fell in love with that book in a way that I couldn't have imagined two years mm-hmm. ago. And so I just, Scripture is endlessly, uh, endlessly just intriguing and wonderful and helpful. So, all right, number two. Biblical theology, Scott, can you read that one? Biblical theology assumes that Scripture's many authors and many books are telling one story by one divine author about Christ. Pastors too often play one note when, as it has been said, the entire Bible is a beautiful symphony. Salvation is more than being saved from debt, loneliness, or a bad marriage. The gospel is even more than the perfect life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Congregations should instead be told how every passage fits into the grand storyline of the Bible, creation, fall, redemption, new creation. Yeah, this would be relevant to the last five or so months. Greg and I have been doing a series on progressive covenantalism, uh, and that's all about number two. So biblical theology is how the whole Bible holds together as one unified whole, and how the covenants fit into that, and how progressive revelation works, and all that stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's why we did that series, is because we want to have an overarching picture of all of Scripture, not just get lost, you know, kind of forced for the trees. You want to see the whole forest, and also get into the trees as you go. And number three... Uh, Jerry, can you read number three for us? Yeah, the needs to be a, uh, there needs to be a proper understanding and necessary emphasis on the full gospel. Where many contemporary churches teach Jesus once to meet our felt needs and give us a healthier self-image, that is not the gospel. The gospel message is that we are sinners who have rebelled against our Creator. But Jesus took the curse that was rightly ours, and all that remains is for us to have faith in Him. So God may credit Christ's righteousness to our account when we de-emphasize sin and damnation to make the presentation more friendly and less offensive. We cease declaring the full gospel. Have uh, uh, some of y'all have seen the American Gospel documentaries mm. that have come out over the last few years? We watched two of them here at church over the last three or four years. Well, the first one, I don't remember, is it is it called uh, Christ Alone? Maybe something like that. The first one is about two hours long. They deal with the prosperity gospel. Some of y'all have probably seen that. So they'll, they'll do clips from like Joel Osteen and Benny Hinn and all those kind of Kenneth Copeland guys on TV who, are, who have a false gospel. But I, I'm watching that right now with some of my students at school in, in Bible class. We're watching through that, and we've, we're almost at the end. Teachers talk next to like the solid teachers, and you go put them side by side. It is amazing how the focus of that preaching is not about sin, Jesus taking the judgment of God, us being like, it's, it's not about that. The emphasis is about self-image, your uh, God, God yeah. giving you your dreams, taking you to a higher level, giving you like a new season of life, like all this kind of like language. It sounds like uh, we call it fortune cookie theology because it sounds like, a, you know, it's going to be a new season for you this year. Uh, and uh, so it's just amazing how they, if you, if you lock some of these guys in a room, they might, some of them might actually articulate the gospel somewhat correctly. Some of them might. But do they preach it with the right emphases and with the right things? No. The emphasis is all, is all messed up. So thoughts there, Scott, on the gospel? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there was one, Mark Dever one time had a guy like watch like TV preachers or something like that yes. and go through a bunch of TV preachers and it was just like one after the other, just nonsense. And then like Adrian Rogers happened to be in there. We would disagree with him on various things, but Adrian Rogers preached the gospel and he just said it was so powerful just to see Adrian Rogers stood out next to all these guys. When the full gospel comes washing over you, it's like a beautiful thing rather than just this fluffy, just nothing. They're not even talking about sin, but like we need the full, full gospel. Don't you think most of the time it's man-centered rather than God-centered? Mm-hmm. And that might be, again, oversimplifying things, but we've got to talk about God, our Father, the Lord Jesus, are you kidding me? Why are we talking about us when we can talk about Him, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and what He said, what He's... Now, we do need to talk about us, but it can't be about how great we are, otherwise we missed it all together. It's got to be about the sinful mess we are and how desperately we need a Savior. Yeah, I, not to pick on him right now, but uh, Joel Osteen's in the documentary, right? And he has this quote in there, which I can't, just burned into my memory. He said, he looks into, this, this Are is you like a... sure? Do we need to hear, uh, it's going to burn into all of our memories. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, he's, quote, preaching to his large church in, 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 uh, in uh, Houston, right? Lake, Lakewood. And he says, this is maybe 2011, I think the sermon was from. He said, um, he said, I've spent time with, over the years, with thousands of people. And he said, I've, I've gotten to know people. He said, this way, his quote was, and what you find out is 99.9% of people aren't bad people. Deep down, they might make some poor choices, but deep down, they're good people at heart. Oh. And so that, Jerry, thoughts of, I mean, you probably haven't oh. heard that quote in a while. Hey. <laughs> what's, I don't know why. What's wrong I don't with that, It feels so warm and fuzzy, though. Doesn't oh, it feel yeah. so warm and fuzzy? Yeah, you just want to go to the scripture and say, <laughs> that is, see, our heart's deceitful above all things. What's good about, about that? I had a parent guy tell me that about their son the other day, a seventh grader. You know, he's, he's really good. Deep good. Down. Yeah, yeah. But they just say, man, that, we have missed it. And that is not what I need to hear. I am plenty <laughs> impressed with myself wrongly without hearing that kind of nonsense. So what I need to hear is who I really am without a Savior, and that is a absolute mess and uh, how desperately we need the Lord. So we don't do anybody a favor to try to convince them how great they are. Hey, y'all may have heard this quote, soft preaching creates hard people and hard preaching creates soft people. Now, that could be abused because there is a kind of hard preaching that's actually evil, <laughs> like just beating people over the head. I'm not talking about that. But the, 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 what, the preaching that doesn't shy away from wrath, hell, Christ's salvation, that just preaches that clearly, creates softened, humbled, moved people. And the preaching that says 99.9% of the people in this room are basically good deep down creates, guess what? Self-centered, arrogant, uh, self-satisfied people who don't feel desperately in need of grace because I'm a pretty good guy. And if you, if you feel that way deep down, you, you're not desperate for Jesus because you're, you're doing pretty well for yourself. Thank you very much. So it feels soft and nice and warm at the front. At the back end, it's, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of lies and it leads to, to horrible uh, situations for people. Can we remember that second quote better than the first one? That <laughs> might be that of, that of the two. Yeah. Ooh. All right. Number four. Uh, Scott, can you read that one? biblical understanding of conversion. When we have a biblical understanding of the gospel, we must then also have a proper understanding of conversion. Conversion is a new birth from death to life and is a work of God. It is not merely a change of attitude or a change of affection, but a change of nature. Conversion does not need to be an exciting emotional experience, but does need to produce fruit to be judged a true conversion. Now, this is one of my hobby horses, probably, this issue here. Um, you know, Scott and I grew up in a wonderful church, wonderful family, but we both had a false conversion. Can you say a word about the, the danger of false conversion in the church and what that can do uh, d- d- damage-wise? Yeah, I mean, it's like easy believism. I mean, you, people will say, you come and pray this prayer, and once you pray this prayer, like, you're in, you're secure, it doesn't matter what you do, how you live. Well, that's, that's horrible. I mean, it's a terrible way. To, and then they, what happens is parents will have this with their kids. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll pray with their kids when they're four. They, they say, you're a Christian or whatever. Then they go off and they live. I mean, we, we know stories oh, of this. tons of stories. Where yeah. they are rejecting God. They're, they're saying they're an atheist. And yet their, their parents are clinging to the fact that they were four years old and they prayed this prayer. I, I mean, literally, I know, I won't say anything about it. But just, I knew a guy who was older than me. He came, he was an agnostic in college. And I remember, I think his mom said, well, when he was eight, he had prayed, he'd been baptized. He was a believer. So we know he's still a believer. And I'm like, he's, he's an agnostic. That's not a Christian. And so later he was converted truly. Uh, years later, he was radically converted and became a true believer. But my goodness, when he was an agnostic in college, to hold on to the fact that he prayed the sinner's prayer, 
I know it feels so much better as a parent, but it is just not true, and it's damaging in the long run. No, I know. So even like Mark Dever had a guy who was, uh, I think he was like an atheist, and Mark Dever was such an evangelist, he was sharing the gospel with him, and then this guy said he was converted, and then Mark Dever brought in the, the pastoral staff, and everybody like uh, talked to him, he told the story, they prayed with him, and he said, everybody left, and Mark Dever just said to him, like, I, I don't know what's happened to you. You may have been converted, but I don't know. He said, time will tell. He said, because my job is not to give them assurance. The Spirit's going to bear witness with their spirit that they're a child of God. Mm-hmm. It's not my job, but the, like we so want to give assurance to people, but, but it's not our job to do it, mm-hmm. especially with our children. Yep. Like It's not our job to do it. And, and so what happens, though, easy belief is when people give people false assurance and people hold on to this, or the parents hold on to this, <laughs> or even the children, but that's not what we want to do. It, so we want to teach the, the, the conversion is a new nature. Like there's new loves. It's, uh, I, mean, I think when I became a Christian, I just thought, I was deceived. I thought I was a Christian. Not. I prayed the sinner's prayer tons of times. Me Every too. time someone offered it, I oh, prayed yeah. the sinner's prayer. Like I remember when talking to my mom when she was saying like she didn't know exactly when she was converted and she like never prayed the sinner's prayer. And I was like, well, how, she's not a Christian. I was just like, I had this totally <laughs> wrong view of conversion. But then when I understood, it's like I'm blind to the glory, glory of Jesus. And then my eyes opened to the glory of Jesus. I thought, how many other people in the church were just like me? And so I think that's why it was a hobby horse for both of us. I think to teach it. It's this. It's a huge change. I mean, I think. And it's one of the one, most wonderful things to see happen. Genuine conversion, mm-hmm. when it happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you just, you just see it happen. We've mentioned Grant before. I mean, when Grant Crane first came to our church, uh, he wanted to avoid me and Jerry because we were asking him uncomfortable questions. That's what he said. Because I was, I was trying to get his conversion. He was telling me, and I'm just kind of like, man, I don't know where this guy's at mm-hmm. uh, spiritually. That's just how I felt. And he was, he was a false convert. He had a great upbringing. We didn't know that at the we time. We didn't know that we at the time. Were, we were kind of wondering what was, was going like on. I was like on the fence. I was just like, I don't know where, where this guy is he at. didn't even know. No, yeah, I don't, I don't think he knew. So. And I think that's why he was uncomfortable when we, I was pressing him on yep. like his conversion. And what. And so then he starts getting involved in our church. And then he's listening to a sermon in the lab. And he's got gloves on. He's got chemi- dealing with chemicals. And he starts weeping from the sermon. He has to race out of there. He's embarrassed. And he has to like take his gloves off, watch his, wash his face. And there was conversion. And he shared with your discussion group that night. And I think you just said, it sound, looks like regeneration has happened. He said he didn't know what before regeneration <laughs> meant. But then I remember it was your uh, ordination party. That's the first time I got to talk to him after his conversion. And I knew immediately there, there was a change in this guy. He had a yep. genuine humility, a genuine love for the word. And of course, time bore witness to the fact that he had been genuinely converted. And there is nothing that just instills such uh, joy and zeal that just... It happens in the body. We had like Hannah Hughes got converted and Jose Rodriguez and Grant, like month well, in three months, three genuine conversions. It was just, I was oh, on cloud uh, nine. Yeah. It is just a wonderful thing when it happens. This is what you pray and you long that it'll happen. I was even thinking, like we pray often the conversions will happen during the, the service. And oh, I, yeah. was it Maddie McKeel? Like yes. when you were teaching on Matthew 7, she was converted in the service when Mark was, this is not even that long no, ago. No, no, let, let me, let me, or, let me add one little piece to that. So th- this is amazing. Yeah. So this is uh, <laughs> one year ago, exactly one year ago. This is gonna. The back this is crazy. Right back it was during the prospective members meeting. When does a prospective members meeting lead to someone getting converted? Like, when does that happen? So this is no joke. She she will be. She put this in her public testimony. So it's not like I'm telling something I shouldn't tell you. They were sitting in one of these tables over here during this meeting exactly a year ago, and. Um, during the part when we go to tables, Greg and I went to their table and we, we all kind of share our testimony. And this is what she tells us the Sunday after that, I think is when she wanted to meet with me to talk about it. She said she told her conversion story on one of those tables. And then she said, I knew when I was telling you when I became a believer that I was not, that, that something was deeply wrong. And I, was, I was not truly converted when I said I was. So she felt like she was just straight up lying about it, her conversion. And so we had no idea what was going on. So then uh, a week goes by. No, no, no. The very next, the very next day, it was, that was a Saturday. The next day on the Sunday, she's in the service, and I'll never forget this. The quotation from the sermon was from sinners in the hands of an angry God. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, was what I was that'll quoting. That'll do it. And yeah, that, that'll do something to you. Mm-hmm. You'll either get converted or leave when <laughs> that gets quoted. But I quoted a very intense part about there's not one reason why since you got out of bed this morning, God has not let you drop into the pit of hell except by his sheer mercy. It's one of those intense Jonathan Edwards quotes. Only Edwards could say it like that. I quoted something like that. And she told me the next week, that was the very moment where the Lord granted repentance. And it was through the Edwards quote. And she became a believer right there in the moment. And the whole, her whole week, everything changed. And then I talked to her dad, Mike McKeel. He's like, she's a completely different person. She, she's talking about the Lord. She's got a joy in her face where there used to be a darkness on her face. She changed her, her whole appearance was different. Like everything about her changed. And now she's a member of our church. She was baptized six months ago and she was singing on our worship team a couple Sundays ago. I mean, that's just absolutely incredible. There's been, like Mike has just testified. It's been a year of a consistent change in Maddie McKeel and she's a new, new person. Yeah, we went to share at our... Uh... Were y'all at the discussion group when she, or me and our family group when she, 
I, w I kept forgetting to ask her. I wanted to ask her, and it was all, finally on a Saturday, I remembered we were having family group on Sunday. I'm like, Maddie, can you do, do, do Oh, yeah. And she, <laughs> and it was beautifully done. Just she couldn't wait to tell somebody. Mm -hmm. And that really neat. And how can, when you look at this, how can conversion be anything but a dramatic change yep. from going dead to being regenerated, to being alive? That's as dramatic as it gets, right? From having no Holy Spirit living in you to having God himself living in you. How can there not be a change from being redeemed where you were slave to sin to become slave to righteousness? Like the dramatic different light mm -hmm. to dar darkness to light. You just say everything about conversion in Scripture is drastic. And so there has to be, now that change looks different in people. I do understand right. that. But there will be a difference. There has to be a difference. And it's not from praying a prayer. It's from God doing the work in someone. That's why we pray a prayer. It's not praying a prayer so that God will do a work. Yep. And, uh, and sometimes we get that mixed up, I think. We're about to take a 10-minute break here in just a second. Um, I want to add one more piece to this issue here. I was at a, uh, I guess I won't say the name. I was at a youth, well, what do you call it, event here in Athens that was large. I'll let you guess what I might be talking about. And uh, it was down the street here, and it was in, this, it was in, the, uh, it was in a large room with hundreds and maybe thousands of, of, of middle and high school students. This is maybe 10, 12 years ago. So I, I had no real job. I was just sort of watching. I just kind of came in to watch, and I had my wife and her roommate at the time were overseeing, or at least one of them were overseeing some middle school girls. And here's what I remember. The speaker is up on the stage, you can imagine, whipping people up into a frenzy kind of a thing, you know, and it's a typical youth kind of retreat sort of thing. And, and this is the part where it sticks with me because I'm so bothered by it. This is the kind of stuff that makes my, makes, makes, I, have to, I, get, I get a little heated uh, when I see this. The, the guy says, kind of gives a sort of a gospel presentation, asks for the response. And we all know what's going to happen, right? The response to these events. So you have, I mean, I don't want to exaggerate, but I would say, Maybe a hundred kids stood up. I mean, I, I don't know how many, but we're talking out of thousands of kids present, maybe a hundred stood up to like, re, quote, receive Christ and become cr Christians, pray to prayer. This is the part where I don't know what to say. The guy kind of waves his hand at all the hundred kids. He tells, stand up, stand up. So like a hundred kids stand up all across middle high school. And he, he just announces, guess what he announces? Every, what, we've just seen them all come from darkness to light. We've seen all these kids have just come to trust Christ. They're, they're believers in Christ. They're, like they're, their eternity has changed. And all this stuff. So everyone's applauding, right? So then here's the thing. My wife's roommate back then, I think her name was Katie. So they, she takes seventh grade girls out the door to talk to them, right? And she's like, okay, like debrief with the seventh grade girls. What just happened? And like almost all of her seventh grade girls stood up. Like, this is a revival. Like all of her seventh grade girls just got saved. This is amazing. So they go out in the hallway and guess what? What just happened? First girl's like, I don't, I don't really want, I don't know. Like, like, I don't even want to talk about it kind of thing. Well, wait, you stood up. Why did you stand up? Well, I mean, like they, my friends she were standing up, up and like, I felt like, you know, the Lord was maybe doing something. So I stood up with my friends. And so like out of the 12 girls that stood up, did any of them have a clear articulation of what was happening? No, and most of them were just confused, and it was just kind of, we all stood up because we stood up. And so, of course, we urge sinners to trust Christ, but we don't say, because you just prayed that prayer, you are definitely in the kingdom, you're definitely saved, because you just gave false assurance to 12 seventh grade girls and a whole bunch of other people in the room. So we, we want to be clear about what biblical conversion is and the lasting fruit that comes from it. Any last thoughts? In the, okay, let's take a break. We'll take a 10-minute break, and then we'll jump back in for the last uh, sections here. I, sh I should just say real quick, we'll, we'll, we'll do the next session, and then when we finish that, we'll do uh, at 11 o'clock or so, we'll gather around tables and we'll get to share our testimonies, and uh, then we'll get to, just a way to get to know each other a little bit better.